What does it mean to be truly free? How does the American Revolution motivate our nation's greatest leaders to create a profound declaration of independence? Discover the brilliance, bravery, and battles our young men endured as Abigail Whitney takes you on a personal journey from revolution to declaration. Good day, my friends. I am Abigail Whitney. I am the wife of Samuel and the daughter of David and Lydia Cutler. And we live in the oldest part of Boston on Union Street. Samuel and I grew up together. Eventually we were married and we will have a large family for the colonial period. Samuel is a merchant by trade. He likes to create prints and sell prints that you could use for beddings and curtains. So I am busy raising a family and helping him out as best I can. Six of my children are gonna be born in our first home in Boston. Samuel, David, Benjamin, Anna, George, and James. Now we are the ordinary family that's living during an extraordinary time for America. We will move out to Concord, Massachusetts in 1768. That's a time when in the city there are a lot of riots and the markets have become very depressed. Our home is on the Bay Road and there Samuel will set up his shop next door and seven more children come along. I am blessed to have Abigail, Lydia, Sam Austin, Joseph, William, John, and Cyrus. Now that's the house that you'll hear about in a little bit where I am at on April 19th, 1775 when the American Revolution begins. Imagine how I must keep my 13 children safe the day the British soldiers come out to Concord. We'll come back to that in a moment. For now, I'm going to take you back to Boston as I'm with child one more time. And Sarah, Mary, Eben, and my last one, Henry, will come along. Now, I hope you take a look at the picture down here of my handsome son, the 17th child and his wife, Lucy Perkins. Lucy's sister, uh, Ruth, has married my Austin. So I have two daughter-in-laws from the same family. So that gives you a little idea about my family and where we are living. You know, in the 17th century, I am thinking of the charter from 1629. That was a time when Governor Winthrop here in America and the King of England decided that we had the right to govern ourselves. The charter was revoked and Samuel Adams, during my lifetime, works hard to reinstate the charter's fundamental liberties. I want to share with you how much of a principle this is. You'll notice that I've brought the family account with me today. It's no less than 140 pages. And on page 22, of the family account, it says that we express a firm attachment to our gracious sovereign King George, but point out a manner in which the privileges under the charter have been violated, denying the right of Parliament to tax us without our consent and a determination to never tamely submit to any infringement of our liberties. For it to come to our family account, you can see that it is very important to many families as well as our political leader, such as Sam Adams. Other men that you may have heard of, like John Hancock and Paul Revere, Ben Franklin, the Sons of Liberties, will emerge to lead us into uh, restoring these fundamental liberties that were taken from us. What gives King George the right to tax us? Hmm, why are we being taxed on the sugar and the stamp, the paper goods? Why should I pay for that without representation over in Parliament? Ringing out the land are the famous words of James Otis. Taxation without representation is tyranny. This is a phrase that all generations to come will identify with. On the 5th of March, 1770, my nephew Samuel Austin will witness a horrific event in the middle of the Boston streets. 
It will go down in history as the Boston Massacre. On that day, five innocent young men lost their lives when the British soldiers opened fire in the middle of the streets. Well, this left a very painful and angry feeling in most of our hearts. Paul Revere will do an etching of that very incident and it will circulate around the colony as print propaganda. Three years later, there is a lot of effort to keep a peaceful protest as no one wanted another disaster that they had seen previously. And so on the 16th of December, 1773, the Sons of Liberty decide to take their action and uh, throw 342 crates of tea overboard from the ships, the Dartmouth, the Ellender, and the Beaver. This was a peaceful protest against the monopoly tea trade that was happening by the East India Company. And in this new land, there is no place for a, a monopoly trade. You might say this act teed off King George. He will close the ports of Boston. Husbands like mine will go ahead and sign what's called non-consumption agreements. The one for Concord has 300 signatures, my husband, three women, and the rest of the townsmen to declare we will not use imported goods. So these activities are the fundamental basis for why we will eventually lead to an American Revolution. Two years after the Tea Party with the ports closed, Sam Adams and John Hancock will meet in Concord. They can no longer talk about freeing the country in Boston, so they must do so uh, out in the countryside, and they choose our town of Concord. My husband will attend the meetings. He is muster master for the Concord militia. And so they will raise an army. Now I've brought some items today that reflect that. Let me show you what is called a leather cartridge case. This is a particular piece that every militia soldier, as a matter of fact, every English regiment will have as well. Made from leather, has on the strap a little brush and a pick to clean the end of the musket. Then inside, wooden chambers with paper cartridges. Women like myself are helping to stockpile thousands of these in case things come to war. Simply put, when you see the militiamen with these, they will take a cartridge out, bite it off, pour the gunpowder down their barrel of the musket, and then they're ready to prime load and follow the commands of their officer to shoot. So this will be carried with my husband as well as other men. On the eve of April the 19th, 1775, in Boston, British soldiers were on Boston's Common and they had been drilling and all of a sudden they started to load their rowboats. Word gets to Paul Revere and uh, he knows that they're going to come out to Concord. It is very true that we have supplies that we are hiding in our little country town of 1800. I happen to have 82 barrels of flour at my house in case we need to feed an army and my neighbors are also hiding supplies. It is the real deal. General Gage will issue orders that they sh his army shall march to Concord to seize and destroy the artillery and arms. And then the spy letter from the French says to search particularly Mr. Whitney's house who lives at the right hand entrance as you come into town. Well, you might call it the map quest of the 18th century because that is exactly where I live and that my house is the only house to have direct orders to have a search. So you can see that we are a little anxious, but we will stand our ground. About five o'clock that afternoon, uh, Dr. Joseph Warren will dispatch, uh, will dispatch William Dawes and he will take what we call the Boston Neck and the Southern Route to notify the towns below Boston that the British are on the march. It's not every day a militia comes marching out of town from the city into the countryside. It is a sight indeed. So Paul Revere will be dispatched at about 10 o'clock by Dr. Joseph Warren. He is dear friends with Dr. Warren, as a matter of fact. And so he is safely rode over to Charlestown where he gets de 
uh, the best horse in the land, Deacon Larkin's Brown Beauty. And off like a shot he goes, the perfect jockey, if you will, and cries out, the regulars are out, the regulars are out. Remember, he has had two lanterns lit in Old North Church as the signal as the soldiers on the common will go over the Charles River, which is water. So Paul Revere is on his way. The regulars are out. The regulars are out. The regulars are out. His mission to go to Lexington to warn Hancock and Adams to get the move on and be safe. He continues on the way to Concord, but in fact is captured by British patrol. It is Sam Prescott who comes to our house at about half past two in the morning. My husband with the other men will rehide the supplies in the middle of the night. He has ordered me to stay home with the children. So I am anxiously, as you will, pacing back and forth as the wee hours of the morning carry on. Before dawn, there has been a fight in Lexington. Nowhere in the orders did it say for them to kill eight men. And that is what is coming my way into Concord. I look around and my son David is missing. He's about 14 years old and I am worried sick. The sun is starting to come up. The Lincoln men come by my house and ask me what I know on their way to Concord's North Bridge. Overnight, 400 militia have gathered at Mr. Buttrick's farm. Joseph Hosmer sees a plume of smoke coming from town and asks Colonel Barrett, are you going to let them burn down the town? And with that, they begin their march down to the bridge to meet the British soldiers. Remember, my husband is there. He is muster master drilling the soldiers. And so you might say later on, he's going to be a son of the American Revolution, just like Sam Adams. Well, shot goes off. We really do not know whose musket it came from. And the command from Major Buttrick is, fire fellow soldiers, by God's sakes, fire. This being the shot heard around the world. Two men will be killed, Isaac Davis and Luther Blanchard. Three British soldiers, all from the 4th Regiment, two buried at Concord's North Bridge and one on the way to town. My husband hurries over the hill the back way. It says, Abigail, quick, hold the young children in the high wheel chase. They will search the house as the order said so. So I'm off to Bedford, Massachusetts, which is just the town over, with the young children and a bullet goes over through the head of Sam Austin. <laughs> like that. So I'm losing David and Sam Austin is nearly hit in the line of fire. All of a sudden the countryside is quiet again and I figure it's okay to get back home. Well wouldn't you know my son David is there and he says mother I did not know there was such danger until I saw the whistling of the bullets and I kept out of father's sight being at the same side of the bridge as the British. Do you realize my 14 year old saw one of the first men die in America's revolution? Think about that ladies and gentlemen. What would it be like if your son saw the first casualty? And so the day wears on, you could tell the British had been there and our items had been moved about and so on. But we are lucky that they did not disturb our goods, uh, but they will have open fire later on. I think they're coming back the next day when in fact they will come back. Weeks later we will have a fight in Bunker Hill where my husband is in fact attending on the 17th of June, 1775. We lost 600 Americans to just short of 300 British soldiers that day. So the revolution continues from Fort Ticonderoga down through the uh, Atlantic the Eastern Seaboard and the last battle, Yorktown, 1781, with the Treaty of Paris signed in 1783. All along the way, we decide we will make a formal declaration of our independence, which is a very profound statement to declare our independence. So, you know, it starts out as when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. Think about that. We are declaring our independence from England. 
And it goes on and finally concludes that we are independent states and free and have full power to level war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. We are declaring ourselves independent. Now let's take a look at some of the Massachusetts signers. And we have five representatives from Massachusetts who are sitting in on the meetings for the Declaration of Independence. On June 11th, 1776, five individuals were asked to partake in drafting the Declaration. It will go and undergo 86 changes. Here we have our own John Adams from Massachusetts. And this is Roger Sherman from Connecticut. Then we have Robert Livingston from New York. And I hope you understand that is Thomas Jefferson. And then we have Ben Franklin with John Hancock leading and Thomas, uh, uh, Charles Thompson looking on. Here, very serious looking is Sam Adams. This is a very important day for him. And then over here, we have Robert Treat Payne and Elbridge Jerry. Ever hear of Jerry Mandarin? Elbridge Jerry is the one to discover that. And so he has uh, figured a way to rearrange the districts in his favor for a vote, gerrymandering. So five representatives from Massachusetts in all for the declaration. Now, John Hancock is the one to sign on the 4th of July, 1776. And then our representatives from Massachusetts sign over in this corner. And the rest of the gentlemen you see around, they all sign in August except the representative from New Jersey. So this little declaration is in fact one of the most important documents in our country's history. And you are looking at some of my favorite patriots who have worked so hard to declare America's independence from England. It has been a pleasure to share with you some of the highlights today of some of my dear friends and patriots, how exciting it is to live during my lifetime. And we must think of how grateful we are for all our patriots here and in our hearts. And we can God bless America. Now I have some more housework to tend to. So thank you for enjoying a little moment with me today.